So welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, taking the in-person workshop online strategies to maximize inclusion for all learners by applying an excellent, or sorry, I got distracted, by applying an uh, equity lens. My name is Leo Taylor. Yes, welcome everyone. Nice to see you here. Well, I'll see your names that is. Good morning. Uh, people are still trickling in, so I am gonna hold off for just a couple minutes. Happy that you uh, are here this morning joining me for this talk. I'm excited to deliver this because it blends um, quite a few things in my background, uh, in-person teaching with, with students at Ithaca College, where I served as an adjunct professor once upon a time, and um, my current role with the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So a little bit more about me. I'm actually an entomologist. Don't let the fancy jacket fool you. I'm a big bug nerd. And um, in particular, I am, yeah, shout out to Ithaca. Great, Christopher. Uh, I am a behavioral ecologist. So I'm fascinated by the evolution of behavior, in particular mating behavior and um, sexual selection. And at its basis, Evolutionary biology is, is devoted to um, explaining difference. So being an evolutionary biologist actually positions me pretty well to talk about difference in general, uh, because we can learn a lot about ourselves, even from the lowly fruit fly, for example. And we have learned a lot about ourselves from the fruit fly. But I digress. Um, I wanna to talk to you today about applying an equity lens to teaching in general, but in particular to uh, the online classroom, the virtual classroom. So this will apply not only to workshops, but any kind of online teaching that you might be interested in doing. So thanks again for joining me today. I'm gonna to go ahead and get started here. I want to acknowledge that the land the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. I recognize that I am a guest on their original homelands. Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Endowments of the university originated with the sale of other indigenous lands. I want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that has and continues to affect the indigenous peoples of this land. I extend my respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people who call these lands home. A caveat about land acknowledgements, especially uh, when coming from a land grant institution, that is they risk being performative unless we are also taking other measures significant measures to reconcile the historical and ongoing impacts of colonialism. So I encourage folks to think about using land acknowledgements in their online classrooms, maybe at the beginning of the semester or your workshops, <clears throat> but also think about what other systemic things need to happen. What are we doing to support the indigenous communities that still exist on our land? What are we doing to support and encourage enrollment and success of indigenous students? What are we doing to recruit indigenous faculty and staff and retain them? So we need to do more than just acknowledge the land. Today, I would encourage you to continue the uh, chat interactions so you can interact with each other. Lucia has just uh, put some instructions in chat if there is a question, and it, it all depends on how active the chat is, if there's a question that you want to direct towards me, I encourage you to use the Q&A so that that gets pulled out separate from, from the, uh, I'm gonna pull that up right now as a matter of fact, from the chat. And I try to keep an eye on chat as we, as we go along so that I can engage with you. So please do participate. I have uh, three primary objectives for you today. I want to recognize the importance of considering equity and inclusion in the virtual classroom. 
uh, identify practices for creating a virtual classroom that is inclusive of diverse learning styles and student needs. So this would include accessibility issues as well. And then provide you with some specific examples of how the virtual classroom can become a place for active learning. And I want you to participate in that process as well. I wanna hear from you. So I, I guarantee some of you have tips and tricks that I'm not going to present. And I want those to be uh, on the table for everyone to benefit from as well. So please do not be shy. However, if you are on the shyer side and you don't feel like contributing publicly, uh, you are welcome to, if it's possible, uh, I think you, yes, you can submit something to me directly. So one of the things that I do is allow participants to uh, share something privately with me and then I can share it on your behalf anonymously. Um, but I anticipate that you, you all will um, not have a problem sharing publicly. We're not talking about things that are too deep today. So in 2018, I came to Ohio State as a 50-50 postdoc and 50% in this role. Um, I was in entomology and I was tasked with creating full length in-person workshops that address issues such as implicit bias, uh, power and privilege. And uh, thanks for that point, uh, Leave. <clears throat> I appreciate that. And I developed three primary three hour workshops that I delivered on a monthly basis in both Columbus and Worcester. And then the pandemic shut the university down and I was told to uh, go ahead and take the time to revise my materials and prepare for when in-person workshops would be available again. I jumped on the opportunity to go online because it's something I wanted to explore anyway to try to improve accessibility and to increase participation. So since March, 2020, I have converted everything to online through Zoom. So one program that I developed was Introduction to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And um, I've developed a whole bunch of other programs that are new and I wasn't offering in person before. So a lot of uh, um, new programs came out of this. I've reached thousands of people in, in this short period of time. It's allowed me to reach people outside of the OSU community. And there's a benefit to that, not just reaching the community, but it increases the diversity of the classroom and the students in the classroom, students being my participants, which are faculty, staff, and students at Ohio State, they benefit from that added diversity. diversity. So moving things online benefited the program in many ways. But I had a challenge because I, I started out just re revisiting my materials and recognizing, okay, how am I going to convert a three hour intensive in-person workshop to a webinar and uh, not have people bored out of their minds and being distracted? Uh, how am I gonna keep them engaged? What am I going to do with exercises involving props? Uh, and I'm gonna give an example of that later. How do I hold people's attention and do I keep it three hours? Because the idea of sitting in a Zoom session for three hours, having someone talk at me uh, was not appealing. And I've been engaged or been involved in sessions like that, uh, a two hour webinar, for example, where someone is just talking and those do not keep my attention. And how do I account for diverse learning styles and accessibility needs? Now, this is something that I've given a lot of thought about when it comes to in-person teaching, something that I went to great lengths to account for when I taught at Ithaca College. So one of the things that I did was use clickers and ask clicker questions throughout my lectures to make sure that students were understanding um, and able to critically evaluate what I was, what I was teaching them. So how do I do this in the virtual classroom? Now I had some experience teaching online. I have taught twice now um, equity in STEM for all genders through the CERTL network. You might be familiar with it. CERTL is the center 
for the integration of teaching, research, and learning. And I highly recommend their programs. So um, actually, I did I get that right? No, is it CRT? Somebody can correct me. Um, no, I think that's it. No, I got the R backwards, C-I-R-T-L. There we go. Thanks, thanks, Renee, appreciate it. Yes, they have fantastic programs. And um, I've been honored to co-teach that gender equity course now twice. And that set me up to have a little bit of idea of how I could navigate these workshops and make them interactive because we make that session, that course, highly interactive by using a platform like Padlet, you might heard of, have heard of, to do um, virtual brainstorming. But um, Zoom is, is uh, an excellent format for doing a lot of things. So we're gonna talk more about some specific tools later. But these are some of the questions that I was asking myself. And I wanted to make sure that I was applying my diversity, equity, and inclusion lenses as I approach these programs. So I want to cover a couple of uh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. I realized that I was not sending to all attendees and panelists. Thank you, Lucia, for pointing that out. Uh, and Jennifer, thanks for commenting. Padlet and Flipgrid. Excellent. Yes, so this is what I wanna see happen. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, any recommendations for other tools? Please share those with um, all panelists and attendees. I wanna um, generate resources here. Um, so I wanna make sure that we understand what I'm talking about when I talk about inclusion and equity. So inclusion is involvement and empowerment where all people are respected, valued, and able to participate fully and have access to the same opportunities. I liken this to, um, remember the movie Sweet 16? So I'm a child of the 80s and I was a Molly Ringwald fan. <clears throat> it's like the dance in Sweet 16 where the nerds were, were welcome to attend the dance, but they were excluded because they were all along the wall. Nobody wanted to dance with them. So, um, you can be invited to the dance, but unless you're asked to dance, once you're there, you're not really included. Now, the nerds could join the dance if they wanted to and probably dance with each other. That would be integration. But unless the nerds are being asked to dance by other people in the community, you do not have real inclusion. So everyone needs to have involvement and empowerment for inclusion to be realized. So for equity, equity is a different concept. I have a poll for you and Lucia is gonna uh, put the poll link. So this is actually a word cloud. So word cloud is a brainstorm. So whatever words come to mind when you think about equity, I want you to um, put into the word cloud generator and I'm gonna switch screens here so we can see that. while you brainstorm. Let's see. Yes, poll everywhere, although it does have some limitations. All right, now you should see the word cloud <clears throat> being generated. Somebody give me a thumbs up and let me know. Thanks, Ben. Excellent. Okay, so the words that get larger are the ones that more people are generating. So we see quite a few different words, fair, <clears throat> fairness, access, opportunity, equal, justice, inclusion, excellent. And then lots of little different things like balanced, 
empathy, everyone, same opportunity, equal start line. Great, thank you for that. Access is clearly a winner here. Let me toggle back. In a second. Okay. <clears throat> So based on uh, what, what we saw there, um, now let's think about it in a different way. Tell me what this image here representing reality where some people have much more than they need to overcome the obstacle, which is represented by a fence here. And some people have way too little, uh, a deficit. This could be likened to generational wealth. Equality, yes, so thank you. Equality would mean something like everyone getting the same amount of boxes. Sarah is going right to, let's just get rid of the fence and we have a long ways to go to get there. The question then to follow up with, if everyone gets the same boxes, would we also have equity? Right. So here's what we could do for equality. What would equity look like in this situation where we have people of, of differing heights and an individual in a wheelchair? Yes, so if you look at the outcome, Rachel's pointing out everyone can see over the fence. And I'm sure uh, you could come up with some clever ideas like, yeah, there we go, a glass wall versus a fence, or we could get rid of it. We could do a chain link fence. We could cut holes where the people's eyes are. Um, and and uh, Charles just mentioned, here's, here's what this artist has, has come up with. Let's give the, the shorter person an extra box. We'll just take the person's box from the left, who's clearly tall enough to see over without a box. We'll give that to the middle person. And then we'll build a special ramp for the person in a wheelchair so that that person can see. So everyone gets what they need to overcome the obstacle. Equality uses the paradigm of not seeing difference. And not seeing difference perpetuates inequality. So how many of you have heard of we shouldn't see race? Or when I look at you, I don't see race. There's only one race, the, the human race. I don't care if you're black, purple, brown, polka dotted. We've all, we're all familiar with this idea of colorblindness. And I love this quote by the, civil right, the late civil rights uh, leader, Julian Bond, to be blind to color is to be blind to the consequences of color and especially to the consequences of being the wrong color in America. So if we don't see race or we, if, if we strive not to see race, how are we going to see racism? If we are blind to sex, how are we going to see sexism? Because the reality is black people do not live the lives of white people. Women do not live the lives of men. Transgender people do not live the lives of cisgender people. All of these things divide, define us and define our experiences based on how this society is, has been built and constructed. It's an oppressive system that favors certain groups over others. So the goal shouldn't be colorblindness. The goal should be to see the differences, to challenge the system of oppressed oppression, to change it, but in the meantime, to make sure that we are providing equitable opportunities for everyone based on their differences. So in the classroom, for example, for example, you wouldn't hand all students a handout with 12 point font, knowing that one of your students needs a minimum of 24, pop, 24 point font to be able to see because they're, they're visually impaired. So equity would say, 
that student needs a different handout. I can use the 12 point for everyone else, but I'm going to make a special print uh, printout for this one student. So equity involves fair treatment that allows for equal access, opportunity and advancement for all people. And it considers the, <clears throat> the unique needs of each person. So we have to see that difference to be able to see their unique needs. Equal access does not necessarily involve equal treatment. And active learning strategies in the classroom are more equitable and inclusive than traditional lectures. So some of you are, are probably very familiar with active learning strategies, but just to uh, make sure, I wanna show a, a brief video clip. What is active learning? Active learning is a farewell to the traditional lecture. No more standing at a lecture and dispensing wisdom in 120 minutes snooze-inducing soliloquies. Anyone? Anyone? The most common belief about active learning is that it's all about students using class time to do things, not hear about them. But active learning is much more than that. At its core, active learning is about creating a continuous feedback loop between professors and students. Feedback professor is used to understand how well their students have understood and mastered the material. The result from a professor's perspective can be less time spent lecturing and more time spent coaching, facilitating, and bringing concepts to life. Reams of research have shown that active learning teaching methods are more effective at improving student success than traditional teaching methods that involve passive learning. In fact, students are 1.5 times more likely to fail in traditional lecture format classrooms than in an active learning classroom. Students in active learning classrooms outperform students in lecture classrooms by 6 percentage points on the same exams, which can mean the difference between passing and failing. And professors who have implemented active learning see an increased ability and willingness for students to participate in class and do their readings, as well as increased motivation. Ultimately, they see better learning outcomes. And isn't that the goal? Whose idea was it anyway? All right, we, we can, you can watch this uh, history lesson later, but <clears throat> I want to just follow up on MJ's comment about if you make all the handouts more accessible, you benefit others as well. And actually, you might actually be benefiting a student who has an undiagnosed visual impairment or doesn't, um, doesn't want to report that they have a need. So including more accessible options in your classroom can uh, benefit other students than the ones that you know have. Uh, yes, many students do not report uh, that, that, um, that you're aware of. So. Uh, so active learning, and there's a question about which ones are important. And I'm gonna give you some very specific things that I've applied to my classroom. And one of your, what you're seeing, and that is if, if chat is enabled for an online program, then I believe the facilitator should be engaging with it. And yes, it can make it feel clunky, but it's the same thing as if you're in a real classroom. And I encourage my participants to raise their hand and ask a question if they need clarity if they want to participate and offer a point because they have something to offer too. Um, yes, and, and captions. Uh, if I'm sitting here giving an online program and I'm completely ignoring what's going on in chat, I'm not getting that feedback loop of what's going on. Uh, and a designated chat monitor can be helpful, but I very much appreciate engaging with participants personally, like I'm doing now, because it gives me feedback on what's going on. And it, it takes, I think, practice to get used to kind of skimming through what's going on. Like earlier, Allison said, plus one Jenna, you know, so great quote, Jenna, you have to kind of keep looking back and forth and, and, um, and refining that skill. But it's a wonderful way to like, feel connected to the participants, especially if I can't see you and also understand what's going on with you and, and seeing your wonderful contributions, seeing your questions. So I encourage you, if you're not familiar uh, with active learning, to do a little more research on that. You can watch the rest of that video, but I have another poll for you. Uh, I'm curious to know how many of you have actually utilized active learning strategies in the classroom, or maybe if, if you haven't, utilize them as an instructor, you've experienced them as a student. So 
thank you, Lucia. Lucia has put the link in chat and I normally like to use Zoom for these polls because then I can avoid having to toggle um, back and forth. Great, I see responses coming in. All right, you should see the poll forming now. I've I've set it up as little clusters of dots. <clears throat> so it looks like the majority of us have. Some of you are unsure, so maybe you're not sure what active learning strategies are. For those of you who have experienced them, perhaps you could share an idea of an active learning strategy. Well, this is one right here. Thank you for that, Ajit. Uh, yes, for, for people who have, um, for example, attention deficit disorder, having anything that's popping up on a continuous basis is incredibly distracting. So there are you know, people who are neurodivergent include instructors. So <clears throat> thank you for that, that comment. So it has to be within the capabilities of the instructor. And, and that's when you have to come up with different strategies. So I can do chat, no problem. I can engage that way. Uh, other instructors who can't do that can use other strategies instead of chat. Yes, thanks for uh, throwing these out here. Think, Pair, Share is one that I love to use in, especially in physical classrooms. Yeah, you can keep those ideas coming. So great. So the majority of us are familiar with active learning strategies. Let me get back to my slides. Get out of that. All right, so um, the, re the research shows that active learning classrooms, or students in active learning classrooms learn more than they think that they learn, which is fascinating. So this study that came out in the Proceedings of National uh, Academies of Science in 2019 showed that uh, the students in, uh, were in passive learning, meaning they were in lecture halls, just being lectured at, versus classrooms that engaged the students through active learning strategies. They assessed the students' perception of the uh, experience, and then tested them and tested their performance. What's fascinating is that if you look at, I enjoyed this lecture, the students enjoyed the lectures more in the passive learning environment. And that was consistent for all of the prompts. I feel like I learned a, a great deal from this lecture. It was higher in passive learning. Instructor was effective at teaching, higher in passive learning. Yet when they tested the students learning, they performed better in the active learning environment. So I think that's a really fascinating contradiction. The students misperceived um, maybe the benefits uh, of active learning, but what they found, so this might make you think, well, students don't like it, so maybe we shouldn't do it. Uh, but what, what researchers have found is that the students warm up to it pretty quickly and, uh, and, and tend to enjoy the activities. <clears throat> However, you know, there are individuals with personalities or with, you know, with neurodivergent conditions, anxiety, uh, introverts that are reluctant to want to engage with, with classmates in in-class activities. Uh, I'm a bit of an introvert myself. And so every time I hear, okay, we're gonna do breakout room discussions. I'm like, eh, I, lo I look at the leave button and I think about clicking it. <laughs> Some days I'm just not ready to engage like that. Um, so, so other things to keep in mind there, uh, you know, active learning strategies, yes, can, can take some getting used to. So getting to the actual nuts and bolts. 
of what I have done to apply that equity lens to the virtual classroom experience. So one of the things I did in uh, the classroom was use clickers. I love using uh, clicker questions that were not graded and, and actually made them apply the content that I was teaching them. And I used think, pair, share with the clicker questions so they could turn to their neighbor, they could talk about it, they could make their, con their conclusions, submit their answer, and then they would get really competitive with themselves. And even like if they got it right, I would hear an eruption of like yeses and like fist bumps and like, uh, you know, they got really into it. It was, it was fun to see. And it was a, that feedback loop for me. Am I doing, and I used it for myself, am I doing a good job teaching this content? Are they understanding it? Because that is on me if they're not. All right, so in the virtual classroom, completely different. Um, I encourage but do not require camera use. And this is because students in particular who have no control uh, over their living environment, if they're, or work their school environment, if they're, say, going to school at home, may not want to show what their environment looks like. Uh, I've also heard some folks encourage students not to use a virtual background for certain environments because it looks like you have something to hide. Well, you know what? I have a virtual background because my living room is also where my two cats and my dog live. It's also where I have a table full of plants set up with a grow light because I'm starting plants from seed for my garden. And there's just a lot going on in this room. Doesn't mean I have anything bad to hide. It's just that I don't want people to see that. Looks more professional to have a background. Limit the amount of lecturing. So not only do we know that it's less effective, but in this virtual environment, the temptation is really great to be distracted and to multitask. And I fall into that. If, if I'm attending a webinar and um, it's the person is just droning on and on and on, I will find myself drifting and you know going over to email. And uh, yes, so Jen, Jean, thanks for that comment. Uh, learners are burnout on me on camera. Now, when you're on camera, you're, you feel like you're on. And I feel like that drains you more. So if I'm a, a participant in a, a, a webinar, sometimes I don't wanna be on camera um, and, and it feels more comfortable, but I'm participating. Yeah, so you have to take into consideration lip reading, although if you have captions, uh, then, then um, folks can read the captions. Use technology. There's so many wonderful things that you can use and people were already uh, contributing ideas for technology. You saw that I used Mentimeter to do some polling and the word cloud. Uh, use polls uh, through Zoom. Zoom is so much easier to use for polls. No toggling back and forth for screen sharing. Um, use other types of technology too, whatever you can use to, to break up that monotony. Use activities and breakout rooms. Uh, come up with activities that individuals do on their own or do together. Using videos is very helpful in other media. So GIFs and um, whatever other types of, of media are available, uh, even just images for discussion. Use those at strategic points to break up content delivery. So it, inevitably we have to deliver content. I have to do that for this talk right here. But if you can, Strategically use various things, polls, uh, um, brainstorming, like on a whiteboard, uh, videos, whatever, uh, photos to, to break it up. It can make it feel less um, monotonous. And I recommend that you include a stretch slash bio break for sessions that are two hours or longer. And you may even want to include one for, say, an hour and a half, just even something as short as two minutes. A two minute stretch break uh, can be a bit of a, a relief. Make sure that you're using inclusive imagery and readings and you can consider using the land acknowledgement. What do I mean by inclusive imagery and readings? Make sure that you're selecting readings that come from women, uh, scholars of color um, and imagery that reflects the diversity of humans. So if you're, 
creating lectures, you're creating your slides, um, and you're doing a Google search. You can even try this right now. This is one of the things that I, I did. Um, I wanted to include an image of a man holding a bouquet of flowers for a particular talk. Google that right now, man holding flowers. And tell me what you find. Lots of white dudes. Oh, interesting, Allison. Yeah, so if you're able to multitask, I like that idea, Renee, if you're able to multitask and you know, I'll do that too, I'll, I'll zoom, I'll tune in to Zoom and on my phone and cook. And it, sometimes it's, it's uh, yes, the multiple screens can be too distracting. So be flexible with your students. If, if, if they wanna Zoom on their phone, let them do it if it's you know, possible. Yeah, so it's easy for us to overrepresent people in our slides if we're pulling photos from the web simply because of the bias that exists in the search engines. So you may have to get very specific about, um, and thanks for that resource. Excellent. Um, oh, these are great. I'm gonna check out nappy.co as well. So you may have to get very specific and that's what I had to do. I, I think I ended up going with uh, Asian man holding bouquet of flowers and I was able to find one that would work. But, uh, but you may have to do a lot of digging, but that's what I mean. We have to be very intentional. And once you've created your slides, go back and look, okay, who is represented in my slides? Oh, uh, Jasmine, so maybe uh, Lucia, you could help out. Make sure that if you're sharing a, a post that you select all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, I'm seeing that uh, say Jay Briggs, Kathy, uh, your, your posts only went to the panelists. Okay. I'll tell you though, the, don't underestimate the power of representation. Students who are in minority groups or marginalized groups Notice, um, I'm an LGBTQ person. I notice when LGBTQ imagery or representation um, is, is displayed. Um, I'm also a person with an invisible disability. So I notice things that non-disabled people might not notice. So it's very, very important that we allow our students, our participants to see themselves in our materials, to recognize that they exist and they're important. I encourage you to record your sessions when possible. Now this might not be possible if you're trying to encourage a specific type of space, like a brave space for sharing in which people might be reluctant to share because of the sensitive nature of, thanks, thanks for that clarification, Renee, uh, and thanks, Sarah. Um, sometimes I don't record my sessions because I'm asking people to be honest about their biases and prejudices. Not everybody wants to be on record sharing that information. So um, if you want to record it, make sure that you have outlets for people to share anonymously or privately and um, record when you can because some neurodivergent people and not even all you know, people who need to have uh, a recording or neurodivergent, but some people have memory issues or retention uh, and attention issues and need to be able to have that option to go back and review the recording. Provide access to handouts if, in advance if you can, because some learners need to take written notes. Uh, and this could include your slides. I sometimes do an outline of my slides so that 
not all the information is there. So I'll go through and I'll delete some of the text from the slides so that the, the individual can then write in content uh, from my slides as we're going through it. Ensure that the slides are accessible. So make sure that your font, your contrast and size of images is appropriate for many different people um, with, with varying visual abilities. I was in a session yesterday and the, uh, at a conference and the presenter said, don't worry, I only have six slides. And then I was absolutely blown away uh, by, it seemed like it was size 10 font. And uh, the, my size, my font here is size 30. So um, it's really important to have the font be an appropriate size. So he had the, the slides jam packed. Yeah, uh, Ajit, yeah, I saw you were at the conference yesterday. Uh, it was full of text and it was so tiny and I've got massive monitors. So Ajit, I can't imagine how tiny the text was on your phone. And I, so he could have easily had uh, mm, double those amount of slides if he, had, if he had formatted them differently. So make sure you're making some very conscious decisions about, about what you're including. Provide live transcription services when requested and if possible. Uh, Zoom is getting better about the free transcription service or li live uh, captioning. And I've tested it in a few different meetings. It's pretty good, but it's biased towards people who speak uh, without a, uh, a, an accent from outside the US, uh, people who speak clearly and loudly. So that can be something you can offer. It might not be 100% reliable. And I also uh, encourage you to, uh, I don't recommend Comic Sans. Uh, this is Ariel, I believe, or Calibri is okay. Um, everyone has something to contribute in the classroom. So view your students also as teachers. And when you view them as teachers, and you make it clear to them that you value their contributions. Yes, the slides will be available later. They will feel empowered to contribute and you're going to get more interaction. And speaking of interaction, allow multiple ways for students to participate. So here are the things that I use and you can come up with additional ones and you've already have, but if you think of others, please let me know. I've already mentioned ways of making contributions anonymous versus public. I make my polls always anonymous. So Zoom has that feature where they can be anonymous or not. I want to encourage honest sharing. Allow people to unmute, allow people to chat in public, but also provide the option for them to, to contribute privately. Again, in, in many of my workshops or webinars, they're dealing with very sensitive issues. And if I'm doing an in-house program, say for a department, and here's a perfect example. I did one recently for um, horticulture and crop sciences here at Ohio State. And a colleague didn't want to share this publicly, but clearly wanted their colleagues to know. And they said, I have ADHD, they said this to me privately, I have ADHD and I'm always afraid that my colleagues are going to think I'm lazy. So I shared that publicly, but anonymously on that person's behalf. And that is how we can make a culture change by communicating these sorts of things in non-threatening ways. Uh, using polls, uh, using whiteboard, Google Docs. So uh, sometimes I'll create individual Google Docs for breakout rooms. And then those breakout rooms will then use that link to go and fill out a worksheet use the word cloud, which is just a brainstorm, and use breakout rooms or discussion groups for at, or an activity. And then you can also do individual activities. So you've already seen me use Mentimeter. There's all sorts of uh, free features there. This is a slide that I use to have people evaluate their stereotypes, their judgments, their biases, prejudices, and embedded in this uh, slide are a bunch of my own um, discovered, uncovered, or um, 
prejudices and biases that are very specific to my upbringing. So I show this one when I talk about implicit bias. And, uh, and I simply give them the prompt and shut up and let them visually digest what they're looking at. And each image has alternative text associated with it that describes in words what the image represents. That way, if someone needs uh, an accessible version of the slide deck, they can go back later and have the screen reader tell them what is in each image. Here's a worksheet that I used to give in person, but I've converted to uh, an online document where individuals work in, in pairs or trios in breakout rooms to fill it in. It's the matrix of oppression that describes which groups, which social identity groups have power and which ones do not. An individual activity that I do in my implicit bias program is the implicit association test uh, that tests your bias against insects versus flowers. So I provide the link and then individuals go, they take the test on their own, and then I have a poll up uh, and ask them to complete the poll when they finish the test. That way I know everybody's done and I can move on. One of my in-person activities for my power and privilege workshop is the beads of privilege exercise. And this involved going around to seven different stations and asking or answering questions and then taking a bead if the answer was yes. Uh, there's a video that I sometimes show that, that addresses the uh, privilege walk, which is similar. But what I did with the beads exercise, it's a really powerful exercise, and I wish that people could have their necklace when they walk away from my program, but they can't unless I mail it to them and get their, get their answers. I created a worksheet that they then privately and quietly fill out, uh, seven sections that address different types of privilege, and they answer questions such as for sexuality, I do not worry about the reaction of friends or family when they discover the sex of my partner. Uh, ability, I can assume that I will easily have physical access to any building. Gender, I do not have to think about the message my wardrobe sends about my sexual availability, and so forth. And if the, uh, yeah, you can take the, the implicit bias test that uh, I just mentioned uh, at the implicit harvard.edu website, but the insect I, uh, flower IAT is not available from their main menu. Uh, the link to that is in this slide deck, and so you'll be able to, to access that um, later if you want. But anyway, each person tallies their total, and that gives them a general idea of how much privilege they have in each category. Then I have them debrief, and that's really important. If you do an activity, you need to do uh, adequate debriefing. Just doing an activity for the sake of doing an activity is, is tokenizing and, and, and not, it can be helpful for the participants, but um, it's much more helpful if you provide individuals, again, with multiple ways to participate in the um, debrief process. And uh, I would say mix it up. You could do debriefing in chat, you could have them unmute, but you could also do uh, a variety of different interactive, use a variety of different interactive tools for each different debrief. So mix it up a bit. So I'm gonna have a look here at chat and also provide you with an opportunity here, a couple minutes to, Thanks, Lucia. Yes, we've got five minutes left and I'm almost done, but I want to see if you have any ideas that I haven't mentioned for maximizing inclusion in the virtual classroom. Yes, um, and I created a document that has the, the I can even, send that to the conference organizers and, and they can include it or just a link to it. I think I have it on Google Docs. That's what I'll do. I'll add a, a link to the IAT. It explains what the IATs measure. It is very important that you introduce the IATs properly and then debrief them. Um, uh, thank you, Jennifer. That's a good question. Do these exercises benefit those who do not have much privilege? Yes, they do. Um, 
but you need to make sure that again, you're framing this properly. You're um, providing a safe container. You're providing that opportunity to debrief. And when those if hurt feelings come up, uh, be qualified or not qualified, but, but prepared to handle it. Uh, I will tell you though, any person who is in multiple marginalized populations is not gonna be surprised by that activity. They know that, they live it every day. Um, so yeah, you do have to be careful. You know, who is this for? Ask yourself and um, just be mindful that there could be some feelings that come up. But what they find out though is, is that everyone has privilege in some area of their life. Everyone, no matter how marginalized. It might not be much, but there's always some privilege. Thank you for these suggestions, I appreciate it. I wanna make, and keep them coming, I'm gonna keep um, an eye on chat here. Thank you, Jasmine, yes, we do. I wanna mention the importance of silence. And remind you that participants need time to reflect on a prompt. And I learned very quickly that silence plays out very, very differently in virtual classrooms. In fact, it's kind of eerie because it's, it's all silence. It's just me, my voice, and nothing, just a kind of a fuzz from the, the speaker. So when I stop talking and wait five seconds, it feels like a minute. And for some reason, that same amount of silence feels different when we're in person. And it's very important that in person, you give students or participants time to reflect on what you just asked, and I usually use the rule of thumb to look at each person in the room before I rephrase. But I don't always have the opportunity to do that. I can't look at 143 people for numerous reasons, uh, not to mention your faces aren't available. But I encourage you, if no one speaks, rephrase after 10, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, if you can bear it, and resume silence. And I guarantee most of the time someone will speak up because that silence is not only uncomfortable for you, it's uncomfortable for everyone else. But some students just need that time to think, collect their thoughts. And also if they're typing a really long response, you might cut them off. So get comfortable with being silence, silent. Allowing for multiple forms of participation helps with this, and it helps encourage um, en engagement from students who might not other otherwise engage. So I encourage you to use mic and chat and other forms that we've talked about. So in conclusion, uh, we know that the traditional lecture has proven to be less effective in the classroom. It's not ineffective, it's just less effective than incorporating active learning Strategies, I'm not stupid, I'm just panicking, yes. <laughs> um, active learning strategies can be applied to the virtual classroom to create an engaging environment for diverse learning styles. Uh, I would argue that you, you have lots of opportunities to create an equitable and inclusive virtual classroom. In fact, some ways have encouraged more inclusion, like that anonymous ability to contribute some, some sort of comment that's not possible in, in, in the real classroom when we're in person, except after the fact. So the fact that someone can essentially slip me a note in the middle of a session and say, hey, I want my colleagues to know that I have ADHD and I'm terrified that they judge me. How powerful is that? So I would argue in some ways there are benefits to being in virtual environments. And there are so many resources available to assist with the creation of dynamic virtual classrooms. And there are some uh, links being put in the article that I referenced earlier, the PNAS article. I also wanna just plug that my office now has a YouTube channel and I'm posting some of my webinars that I've been recording. 
Thanks, Rini, to the to for posting a um, reference guide. And I also have a feedback survey that I, I'd love to get your thoughts about this talk today. There's the link, but you can also use your smartphone to uh, use your camera for this QR code, and it'll take you directly to the uh, survey. Yes, chances are the ed tech department would be happy to help. And I'll tell you, the, the folks who had a look at my slides made some improvements that I'm thrilled about. Uh, so I appreciate that contribution to this presentation. And here is my contact information. Again, I'm in the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. And uh, you can check out our resources online. We have a, a, a nice website with a variety of resources. I specialize also in inclusive hiring practices. And we have quite a few resources on there under the employment tab. And I offer um, monthly webinars that are open to the entire Ohio State community. Sometimes those programs are open to the general public. So on our website there uh, that was just put into chat, you can uh, find more information about present and uh, past programs. I do also provide programs uh, for a fee to other institutions. So if, if that's something you're interested in, feel free to reach out.